thank you, Professor Zhang. We do hope that you all have a productive and happy experience with this webinar conference. Now we will begin our, our first session of keynote speech. Please join me to welcome our first keynote speakers, Professor Thomas Schultz. Thomas Schultz is a university professor for life science, informatics, and visualization at the University of Bonn, Germany, where he is heading the visualization and the medical image analysis group at the BIT and the Department of Computer Science. His work focuses on the development and the integration of computational tools for quantitative image analysis, machine learning, and interactive visualization in order to gain insights from large, complex, and dynamic image data, which challenges traditional approaches to image analysis and uh, interpretation. He has served as an area chair member at various conferences, including Mikai, Lido, IEEE Vesel, Euro Vesel, Pacific Vesel, and the VCBM. Today, he will present his keynote speech, which is titled Interpretable and Interactive Machine Learning for Medical Image Analysis. Welcome, Professor Thomas. So now hopefully everyone sees my screen and hears my voice. So good morning. Thanks for the kind uh, invitation to speak this morning to you about interpretable and interactive machine learning for medical image analysis. So I would like to mostly talk about uh, interpretation and interaction. Of course, I would like to motivate why I think that this is actually quite relevant in the context of this conference. But for the end, I also have a little bit extra that you can look forward to. So let's dive in so that we actually get to this. This conference is about medical imaging and computer-aided diagnosis. And if you look at the program, you're going to find that machine learning is now the predominant approach for this. If we make such machine learning approaches interpretable, that means that they cannot just suggest a diagnosis, but they can also provide us with some insight about why they made the specific suggestion. And this is quite relevant because often it's not enough to evaluate these methods in terms of the accuracy that they achieve, but it is also important that they give us the right answer for the right reason. So a very famous example is that recently with the COVID, pan uh, COVID pandemic, of course, many people have attempted to detect COVID best based on chest uh, X-ray images. Uh, and sometimes the numbers look really nice, but then if you look more closely, you find that some of these studies have used a mostly adult uh, COVID patient population. And as a control group, they included many children. So then it becomes questionable. Is the method really able to detect COVID or is it more picking up on the difference in age? So this is, of course, highly relevant also for making sure that our methods work correctly uh, in, in other contexts and increasing the trust into the algorithms. And I would like to argue that this type of interpretability becomes especially relevant when we aim to make use of the astonishing ability, especially of deep learning, to pick up on very subtle patterns so far, in some cases, have even escaped the human attention. So if we try to uncover such novel diagnostic markers, I think it's especially relevant to consider interpretability to make sure that the algorithms are doing still something reasonable. So this is exactly uh, the first application example also that I brought this morning. So here with collaborators at the local eye hospital, we were looking into peripheral arterial disease. So this is a narrowing of peripheral arteries. Often it affects the legs. There is actually a quite high diagnostic demand because at currently the early stages of this often remain undiagnosed. Now you might ask if this is a narrowing of peripheral arteries, uh, what does the eye clinic have to do with this? Well, we believe that we can use the eye, not just as the poet says, as the window into your soul, but actually also in, as a window into what happens uh, within the rest of your body. Because the underlying condition of PAD is atherosclerosis, which 
can actually affect all the arteries, including the ones in the eye and the big benefit of the eye that it is very easy to image. So our hypothesis was that indeed fundus photographs, as you see it on this slide, they might reveal early signs of PAD, even if so far no human by looking at those images would be able to detect this. But we further believe that because these signs are probably quite subtle, uh, we, uh, I think we would need to process these images at a high resolution. We shouldn't downsample them a lot as it's done in many current image classification approaches. So for this reason, the technical approach that we took uh, to trying to detect signs of PAD in these retinal images was based on multiple instance learning. And now multiple instance learning is to begin with an approach to weekly supervised learning. So the idea is that you have a set of items called instances, which you don't want to label individually. Instead, you collect them into a set, a so-called bag, and then you only label the overall collections, the overall bags, especially you give them a positive label. You say, okay, this bag uh, corresponds to PAD. If it it contains at least one positive instance, yeah, one sample that shows a sign of PAD. In particular, we are using a specific flavor of MIL called attention-based multiple instance learning, which also uh, learns a mechanism to pay specific attention to some of the instances. So it gives them a higher weight in the final decision. So this we're going to use for interpretation in the end. So the way that we apply this idea of multiple instance learning to our problem is that we actually cut up the retinal image into image patches, as you see it indicated here. Um, and we collect them in a bag that we label if the image was showing the eye of a PAD patient, uh, we label it uh, as PAD. And now, thanks to this multiple instance learning logic, this makes sense, even if only some of those patches exhibit actually signs of the disease. So that's the, the general approach that we take. Yeah, we represent the image as a bag of image patches. Another benefit of this is because we hypothesized that the signs are quite subtle. We wanted to preserve the full image resolution. Working with these patches allows us to do so. Um, of course, we have to make the assumption that um, the, the science of the disease, the, detecting them does not require a larger context. So this is lost by taking this local patch-based perspective. Also, the location where in the image a patch comes from, this is not available to the downstream analysis anymore. But we assume that probably it's something in, in the vessel structures that you can notice even by just looking relatively locally at the vessels. And now we have this attention mechanism that allows the network to pay special attention to some of those patches, which we hope is going to both increase accuracy because it can disregard the irrelevant parts of the image. And it should allow us to interpret the result and see if it can do the task, does it do so in a, uh, based on, on a plausible mechanism. Before we do the interpretation, always the first question is, does the, the network even manage to do the task? But here, indeed, we got uh, the best result we got uh, was um, an area under the ROC curve of 89%. So it seems that we can do something valuable here. Two uh, technical remarks. It, first, to get this to work, it was actually quite relevant to pre-train on a related task. So just pre-training the network on the standard ImageNet dataset um, did not give satisfactory results. However, it helped a lot to pre-train our architecture because, yeah, our dataset wasn't that large to pre-train it on a large amount of retinal images from a diabetic retinopathy detection task that was publicly available. So that greatly boosted um, the accuracy that we could achieve. And we also tested this hypothesis that we had that indeed you need a high image resolution to detect those changes. So we tested this by subsampling to just 299 squared pixels. And indeed in this case, the ability to detect early signs of PAD, it was lost. 
Somewhat surprisingly, the highest accuracy was not achieved for the original full resolution, but we could get even a slightly better result by subsampling to 800 square pixels. So this might suggest that the relevant information is still present at this resolution, but then we managed to get rid of some of the relevant fine textural features or noise uh, via this amount of subsampling. So after seeing that indeed the classifier appears to pick up on some relevant signal, we can actually interpret the attention weights and check where does this come from. So here it's overlaid as these red heat maps on top of four correctly classified images. And already visually, we get the impression that indeed it is focusing on the major uh, vessel arcades. So that fits quite nicely with our hypothesis that the information should come from the vasculature. But of course, it's a little tempting if you have such a hypothesis to cherry pick specific examples that agree very nicely with it. Um, so I actually forced my poor student to do the annotations that you see here of the individual vessels, but also of the optic disc and the macula so that we could actually systematically using statistical methods over the complete test data set, check is it really the case that these anatomical structures achieve, or patches that include them, achieve uh, higher attention weights from the network than patches that don't include them. So this gets visualized in the box plots here on the right-hand side. And with the stars, we indicate the cases where there is a statistically significant difference. So most of the vessel arcades and the optic disk indeed they receive higher attention weights than the patches that don't show such structures. Yeah. Originally, we had hoped also to, to distinguish between arteries and veins, uh, but since they run so closely that they mostly end up within the same image patches that unfortunately did not turn out to be feasible. So that wraps up the initial contribution that I would like to present this morning, the idea of using this attention-based multiple instance learning. We applied this to the task of detecting peripheral arterial disease based on uh, fundus images of the eye. This allowed us to preserve a quite high resolution of the images. And then the nice thing in terms of interpretability is that analyzing these attention weights also allows us to identify relevant structures. Of course, we hope to further refine and evaluate this with a larger data set. And if you would like to try this approach on your own data, we made the source code available on GitHub. So now we can move on to the second topic, interaction. And here I'm mostly going to see interaction in the context of medical image segmentation, which is of course a crucial step for image-based diagnosis and treatment. So often if you have segmented something, you can quite easily quantify it, maybe in terms of the volume. You can also use this as a basis to compute more sophisticated radiomic features. Or if you are going to use, for example, radiation treatment, you can use this to define treatment volumes. And especially in those applications, it's highly relevant that the segmentation should be accurate in each and every individual subject. Now, the deep learning approaches that we have, often they can give us very high quality segmentations on average, but it is quite common that still some individual failure cases remain. So I'm arguing that especially for finding and eliminating these remaining failure cases, interaction can help us a lot. So with this proofreading and correction process, interaction is also crucial for providing suitable annotations for the training in the first place. But due to the time constraints, I'm going to focus on the proofreading aspect. So to motivate, again, the clinical context for this here, the collaborators are interested in age-related macular degeneration, which sets in in yeah, many people with age. So here you see a small uh, simulation of how this could affect your vision. Our collaborators would like to uh, diagnose and track this disease. And an early indication of this, if you look at cross-sectional images of the retina as they are provided by an imaging modality called optical coherence tomography, you're going to notice these elevations in the retinal pigment epithelium layer that are referred to as grusin. 
And they are actually highly relevant for tracking and detecting this disease. So if we would want to know what's the volume, what's the location, what's uh, the, the number and so on of these drusen. And since they actually have thousands of data sets. Of course, this cannot be annotated completely manually. We do need an automated technique, which we made for them in 2017. So based back then, we tried out different deep learning based approaches. The one that actually worked best in our experience worked better than trying to uh, predict the Drusen directly was to go first via the relevant retinal layers. So the overall pipeline that we set up first made probability maps for uh, the relevant retinal layers, then reconstructed yeah, the actual trajectories using a shortest path algorithm, and then post-processed that to find those characteristic elevations that indicate the Drusen. And back then, uh, compared to the state of the art, which at this time was to non deep learning based, we had a big improvement. Also, the collaborators then managed to use this to check for um, the, the effect of experimental treatment on Drusen volume or to correlate Drusen volume with visual function measures. But still, even though the segmentation worked a lot better than before, there are these remaining failure cases. So, in I brought this one example where here we have an additional uh, biomarker of AMD called geographic atrophy. And apparently that made it more difficult uh, for our pipeline to detect the Drusen. So here two of the Drusen uh, in, in red, they are annotated by, by the manual expert, but our method has missed them. So now the question is first in this large volume of image data, how do we find the relatively few cases where errors such as this still occur? So for this, we would have to quantify the uncertainty in the segmentations that we are making. So indeed, we proposed two uncertainty measures, one directly based on the probability with which the network has detected a layer. So the idea is if this has been detected with low confidence, that's an indication of uncertainty, but also if within the same image column, you have multiple detections with high probability, that indicates that there's an uncertainty with respect to where exactly should the layer be localized. This we managed to quantify using entropy. So these two uncertainty measures first, we went to validate them based on 365 2D B scans with respect to two references, first, all of these segmentations, we rank them manually on a scale to one to five with respect to segmentation quality. We said, okay, does do our uncertainty measures correlate with these manual rankings? And we also correlated them to an error-based ranking where we just computed the deviation between the network prediction and the manual annotations. And then we asked, okay, do the uncertainty measures correlate with the errors in that sense. And actually both of them showed a quite decent correlation on the same level as the manual ranking and the error-based ranking actually correlated with each other. And we saw a small benefit even from combining the two. So in the final tool that we provide, we made this graphical tool for finding and, and fixing the remaining errors. We actually use both of these uncertainty measures. And we most, mostly use them for navigation. So you see them color coded down here. So the very saturated colors indicate a high uncertainty and the user, but just by clicking there, they can very quickly navigate to the corresponding images, look at them and identify potential remaining errors. But then also fixing them should be made more efficient. And for this, we could actually exploit some of the intermediate representations from our pipeline. So remember that we're using this shortest path search to actually reconstruct the layers. This shortest path search, it can be quite easily constrained by uh, here, if a, a druser has been missed, just by clicking on one point um, on the druser, we can constrain the shortest path that reconstructs this layer to go through this one point. And often this information is sufficient to give a plausible reconstruction of the overall user without having to manually trace it entirely. So that saves a lot of time. Also, it works here for some cases where more than one user has been missed. Of course, it's also because this is three-dimensional data. It's highly likely if that 
the algorithm missed a structure in, in one of the scans, in the neighboring scans, the structure is still present and has also been missed. This happens quite frequently. So also we did this transfer across 3D that if you take the effort of fixing one 2D slice, automatically the system proposes to correct it also in the neighboring slices. And finally, yeah, the task of detecting the drusen from the layer segmentations. In most cases, this is very straightforward, but it starts becoming difficult if we have very large and extended drusen. We found that in those cases too, there were some errors happening that were however easy to fix with a simple interaction, just marking uh, the region where the drusen exists by clicking here, dragging to the end of that region. And then usually this provides enough information for uh, this semi-automated uh, drusen extraction to do the right thing. So those are this in this specific application. Um, uh, those are the, the tools that we came up with. We evaluated this with uh, two test users and we found that both the guidance that was afforded by visualizing the uncertainty and these semi-automated tools that we provide, they greatly reduced the time that was uh, required to find and fix the remaining problems in the segmentation. So for the layer segmentations, about half of the time could be saved compared to not using our advanced tools. And for getting the drusen out of the layer segmentations, we could even save between 70 and 80% of the time. So this is my main claim for the second part of the presentation that, uh, if you have an application where it's really important to find and correct remaining errors in CNN-based image segmentation, it's worth thinking about suitable user interaction techniques. And in particular, uncertainty visualization, it can help guide your expert to the problematic cases. And often by using intermediate representations of the overall pipeline, we can provide also semi-automated tools that greatly reduce uh, the effort that then the human has to take. So now I think we still have a couple of minutes to talk about uh, this third topic, which actually arose as a consequence of um, the uncertainty visualization in the previous project that I uh, showed you. Because yeah, for the uncertainty visualization, we relied on the probabilities that are estimated by the network itself. But as I'm sure many of you are aware, those tend to be unreliable, especially in cases when you have trained the network on images from one specific scanner, but then you try to segment images that come from a different scanning device. So the example here, it's just a brain segmentation from uh, MR images from six different MR scanners. So in this scenario, even if you have a segmentation pipeline that works well on the original scanner, unfortunately, it tends often to, to fail on images from a different scanner. And it's especially problematic that it does so with high confidence. So it, it's, its probabilities don't even indicate that there's a problem here. So this is a, a challenge that we are currently looking into. But what I wanted to share in the final couple of minutes is that we actually found a nice way to greatly reduce this overall problem uh, of, of uh, scanner change in the first place. Um, we can actually improve the across scanner generalization I'm claiming for less than free. What I mean by this is that many of you who do image segmentation are, I guess, familiar with the known new net which is actually a very nice uh, baseline for medical image segmentation. Um, but it trains the overall network for 1000 epochs with uh, the stochastic gradient descent optimizer. And what we found experimentally on two data sets here, I'm just for, for reasons of space, just showing one of them. Um, on both of these data sets, we found that training for only 50 epochs at a greatly reduced computational effort, this is what I mean by less than free, um, with a recently introduced adaptive optimizer called Evergrad, we got actually similar accuracy on test data from the same scanner. So in this example here, yeah, we see here the test data from the same scanner 
almost the same accuracy for um, uh, the, the known unit default and just 50 epochs of Evergrad. But then the interesting thing is you get an even better generalization to images from other scanners. So here we see five other target scanners. And in all of those cases, yeah, the segmentation accuracy was higher. Uh, the star here indicates that this was statistically significant according to the test that we did. And uh, in some of the cases, actually the margin is quite impressive. So here on the, the three Tesla Siemens, it went from 82% to 89%. Just by saving a lot of computational effort by training for fewer epochs, the obvious explanation for this is that it seems that there's an overfitting issue here in the default settings of the known unit. So we looked into this and we claim uh, that this is due uh, to different training speeds that you get with the stochastic gradient descent um, in the unit architecture. So you can plot the average weight updates here after 50 or 1000 epochs um, in uh, the unit. And even though they used deep supervision, we see actually quite substantial differences here, which are pretty much equalized when you use this adaptive Evergrad optimizer. So what the, the hypothesis that we propose to explain this observation that you can actually get better results with much less computation um, is that properly training the coarse resolution levels, yeah, which uh, have these tiny baby steps with the SGD algorithm requires a large number of iterations, um, which however overfit the fine levels that learn much more quickly. Okay, something that I should maybe also point out about the table here is that you cannot get the same result just by stopping the SGD earlier. You can also run 50 epochs of SGD, but then the results are actually in most cases uh, quite a bit worse than running 1000 epochs of SGD. So the really the adaptive optimization here is crucial. And that also fits quite nicely with uh, some other recent work who has found that yeah, if you need to do domain adaptation by refining on some images on from the, the, the target scanner, they recommend refining the first rather than the last layers. This is also nicely explained by our hypothesis that the first layers, if you optimize with SGD, they overfit. Um, indeed, in these works also, they optimized with SGD. And in the later work also, they introduced uh, the so-called spot tunet that adaptively selects itself, which layers should be refined. So here we can visualize the layers that it selected for refinement. Um, also, this is with SGD training and these policies, they change uh, uh, dramatically when we switch to this adaptive optimization. So this is something that I think is uh, nice enough that I wanted to advertise it here because in fact, it allows us to save a lot of computation. Yeah, rather than having to run 1000 epochs, which is very time and energy consuming, we can do just with 50 epochs by making this actually also quite simple change just to the adaptive optimizer. And um, we found that with this trick, you can improve actually the across scanner generalization of your units. Uh, or less than free. And since I think many people here are training units frequently, this is a trick that I just wanted to share here in the end. Of course, an obvious question is, so we recommend to go from the, the default of 1000 epochs in the known unit to just 50. Yeah, the obvious question is, uh, shouldn't this be adapted to the, the data? Uh, but this might not be that easy if you don't have labels or even images from the target domain. So this we can still look into. So with this, uh, I'm at the end of the three uh, topics that I wanted to briefly introduce today. Um, so I would like to thank you for your attention. Since I'm not sure how much time there are for questions, I actually put also my email address here so that if you can contact me if you want. And of course, I want to thank the students who actually did all this work. So for this multiple instance learning, it was Simon Müller. For uh, the interaction and uncertainty visualization, it was Sheko Figorgi Zadeh. And for the final experiments and explanations concerning what optimizer should we use for the units, that would be Rasha Sheik. Okay, so with this, I'm done with my presentation. Thanks again for your attention. And I'm not sure if we have actually 
the opportunity to take questions. Professor Thomas, there is a question. Can you see it in the Q&A menu? Or I can read it for you. Can you see it? Yes, so now I see a question about uh, the first part, uh, about the back sampling strategy. Um, maybe I should clarify uh, that we, uh, the, the bag contained uh, all the image patches. So we didn't take a subsample here. Of course, we ex excluded uh, the patches that just showed background and that or the ones that showed primarily background. Uh, but the patches that actually showed part of the fundus, uh, we, we included all of them in the bag. Yeah, we didn't subsample here. I'm not sure if that, that answers the question. Do you have any other question for Professor Thomas? For the panelists, you can please uh, unmute yourself and ask questions. For attendees, please type your question in the Q&A. I will forward it to Professor Thomas. Okay, thank you for the answer. As the time li limits, let's move forward. Anyone who is interested in Professor Thomas' work, you can contact his email. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot.